The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. In the evening of the same day, the first day of the week, the doors were closed in the room where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them. He said to them, Peace be with you, and showed them his hand and his side. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord, and he said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so am I sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. For those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. For those whose sins you retain, they are retained. Thomas called the twin, who was one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. When the disciples said, We have seen the Lord, he answered, Unless I see the holes that the nails made in his hands and can put my finger into the holes they made, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. Eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were closed, but Jesus came in and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he spoke to Thomas. Put your finger here. Look, here are my hands. Give me your hand. Put it into my side. Doubt no longer, but believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. There were many other signs that Jesus worked and the disciples saw, but they are not recorded in this book. These are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing this, you may have life through his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The human trait of mercy, what do we make of it? You know, we, we always tend, always in the sense that, or we rather, not just here, but possibly the general human population would always associate the word mercy with the female gender, you know, the woman, or a, you know, a, a girl, or a woman, a lady, and never see a man as being merciful because if you look at the human history you will you will see men portrayed as being harsh very hard very judgmental very you know very like you don't you don't see men as being portrayed as compassionate or merciful or loving often portrayed as somebody just you know like no emotion portrayed and you see the women being portrayed like uh, the, the other way, you know, being merciful, being loving, being nurturing and all that. So this is, it is not surprising then when in the old days, they will, people will see God as someone who is not merciful just because we put a male gender to God's name. We put a he. Now, because we know that God has no gender, there's no he or she, just that semantics. You know, but we, we cannot think of God as male or female because it's neither. It doesn't have any gender. And so to attribute such human thing to God would actually be rather ridiculous. And for people who make the argument that in the Old Testament, you will only see God being vengeful, God being angry, God is the God of war and all that kind of things, they never obviously read the Old Testament properly. Because 
If you look at the book of Exodus, would an angry God or vengeful God bring the people out of Egypt? Will he relent over and over again when people in the leader interceded for the people of Israel? We know that in the Old Testament, the people of Israel kept falling into sin, kept rejecting God, kept falling away. But God never rejected them. He says he will punish them. But when someone interceded, he always relent. Isn't that mercy? If you look at the prophets, all the prophets that prophesied, that brought the message of God to the people in exile or post-exile, you will see messages of comfort, of asking the people to come back to God, who is a loving God, who is a merciful God. So we need to get rid of this notion that the Old Testament God is a God of anger, is a God of uh, jealousy, is a God of war and all that kind of thing. It is not. Because if we truly read the Old Testament book by book, you will see actually God is someone loving and merciful. And this is what Jesus brings to us during this time. This is what Jesus is trying to bring to the people of his time. Because even during his time and probably up to the 17, 18, even the 19th century, people still thought that way. The church still saw God as someone who is harsh, a accountant, a judge, a policeman. Until, of course, we have uh, St. Faustina, who gave us this image of the merciful God, the divine mercy, the merciful Christ. Mercy, like I said, is not gender-specific. So it is a personality trait. Whether or not we are male or female, it doesn't really matter. Because compassion, mercy is something that we pick up along the way. It is up to us whether to be merciful or not. In the case of the Gospel today, you will see always, today is the, uh, we always call it the Doubting Thomas passage. Poor Thomas, always cannot blame. But then if you think about it, uh, do you think the other disciples did not doubt? Do you think that their faith was so strong that they never had a shred of doubt in them? If you look at the readings from the Easter Vigil, the Gospel, the Gospel of Easter Sunday, the Gospels of the Easter Octave from Monday until yesterday, you will see different disciples expressing their doubts. You see Simon Peter the sons of Zebedee and all that, going back to their old profession of fishing. What does that tell us? Even though they were told that Jesus would die and would rise again and would appear to them, they said they believe, but do they really believe it in their hearts? Because if they did really believe, they would have changed their ways and not gone back to their old ways, their old life. Going back to fishing tells us that they have reverted back to who they were before Christ came to call them. And even Jesus reprimanded them for their obstinacy and their unbelieving. So we cannot just always point to Thomas and say, ah, this is the guilty one. He is always the doubting one. No. Every single one of them has to a certain degree, doubts about the resurrection of Christ. And which is why in the Gospel, Jesus appears to them. And the most important thing he said, <coughs> it's not actually about forgiving sins and retaining sins. He said it three times. Peace be with you. Three times. Twice when Thomas was not there, the third time when everyone was there. Because he knew they were living in fear, they were afraid, they did not know what to think. And so his words of peace be with you confers on them the peace that the world cannot give. Now, all of us will face difficulties at one point of our life. Challenges, sorrows, traumas, sadness, loss, whatever you can name. And we will always be disturbed. We don't have peace of heart, no peace of mind. And very often, we resort to earthly ways to try and find peace. 
which is why people resort to drinking and everything else, all kinds of substances and whatever the world can offer, thinking that it will give them solace and peace. But those peace do not last. It is only the peace that God gives us that will last, because that is the one that will be buried deep into our hearts that nothing can take it away from us. But it doesn't mean that when we have the peace of God in our hearts, our life will be all nice and rosy. It will be all smooth. No, it is not like that. The peace of God is there to help us navigate the difficulties in life, to difficulties and challenges in life. That is what the peace of God is, is for. Not to get rid of all our troubles, but to give us that strength to face those troubles. Just like the apostles, the disciples, who after the resurrection, no, Jesus no longer with them, but they have received this peace, this spirit, they face life head on. And this is what we are all called to do. The message of Easter is to give us that joy and that peace, knowing that the world cannot overcome us, but we can overcome the world in whatever circumstances. The choice is up to us, but we cannot do it alone. We can only do it with the grace of God, with the strength of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of Christ, and the light of Christ. And so we pray that the light of Christ that shines brightly during this Easter season will continue always to shine brightly in our hearts and in our lives, so that even in the darkest moments of our life, that light will continue to shine and be a beacon that leads us out of darkness into God's wonderful light.